Well, greetings from Nepal. Sorry I couldn't be here today, but thank you so much for letting me do this via the digital world. A big thanks to Ethan for helping me record all of this. Um, and I think it's also a nice highlight. So all of these videos are going to be up on the Moran Core website. And this is kind of a nice example to show a lot of the work that we've been doing where uh, we now have the slides as, long as, as well as the presenter, which I think is really fantastic. So I'd encourage you guys all to go check that out. Uh, my presentation today is going to be on retinal manifestations of juvenile dermatomyositis. It's a, based on a case report that we had of a bilateral diffuse choreal retinopathy, and then in, additional, in addition, a review of the literature of retinal manifestations of JDM. So my case is a 13-year-old patient who was previously completely healthy who presented to Primary Children's Hospital with approximately a one-month history of fatigue, muscle aches, nausea, and five days of bilateral diffuse blurry vision she didn't report any double vision. She didn't report any pain in her eye movements, no flashing lights or floaters, and otherwise just was feeling pretty good in terms of her vision, but it was just diffusely blurry. Uh, she denied any recent sick contacts or any recent travel. Her ocular history was otherwise unremarkable, as was her past medical history. In terms of her social history, she lived with her parents here in Salt Lake City. Uh, she does not, did not abuse any drugs or alcohol. She didn't smoke. She'd have a dog at home, occasional cat exposure with family members, um, but otherwise was not sexually active and did not have any other notable risk factors. Her family history, there was no autoimmune family medical history or ocular history. She was using NSAIDs, PRN, but otherwise no regular medications, and she had no known medical allergies. On exam, when we saw her in the ER, she presented with a visual acuity of 2200 in both eyes. Her pupils were equal and reactive to light and accommodation. She had full motility, no red desaturations, and her confrontational fields were full to counting fingers. Uh, her bedside anterior exam was relatively completely unremarkable in terms of the anterior segment, but her posterior segment was quite notable. So this is a uh, color fundus photo of her right eye, and what you'll see and that's notable is that she does not have any vitreous inflammation or haziness. Her optic nerves are exquisitely crisp. Her vessels, there are some tortuosities, particularly to the retinal veins. And then you'll notice that there's sort of a di diffuse uh, macular edema with sort of blunting of the foveal reflex, as well as these sort of percherflecken like cotton wool spots in the nerve fiber layer that are primarily located around the optic nerve and centered over the macula. The left eye has a very similar picture. It is worth noting in the right eye there are a few scattered intraretinal hemorrhages, but these are not the predominant finding. She obtained a fluorescein angiogram the following day in Dr. Vitali's clinic. And this is an early uh, phase of the FA. And what you can see is that there is early retinal vasculature wall staining, particularly of the retinal, ve retinal veins or venules. And as you progress through, this is probably one of the most notable findings on her FA. She has this multifocal pinpoint hypo, hyperfluorescent uh, changes of her RPE and her choreal capillaris. There's still the venous vascular wall uh, staining. Um, and you know this is sort of a diffuse process that was noted both in the right eye and the left eye at a slightly later phase, almost like a starry night type picture, like you could see in sympathetic ophthalmia or VKH or similar syndrome. And late, you see the, still see these pinpoint lesions with continued leakage, and again in the left eye. So here's just a panel of her color fundus photo, as well as her uh, sort of mid to late FA findings. Her OCT from that day, what's notable is she obviously has significant macular edema with intraretinal cysts, as well as a subneuroretinal sensory detachment in both the right eye and the left eye, almost like a volcano, you might say. So in summary, we have a 13-year-old previously healthy uh, female who has, now has a one-month history of fatigue, muscle aches, nausea, and this five-day history of bilateral blurred vision, and on exam has a diffuse bilateral macular edema with associated cotton wool spots or perchard flecken-like changes, and an FA demonstrating this sort of bilateral diffuse choroidopathy with venous leakage. So when we initially saw this patient, it did somewhat remind us of a Percher's, -like, a Percher's retinopathy or Percher's-like retinopathy with this sort of diffuse cotton wool spot or nerve fiber layer involvement with macular edema that's centered around the posterior pole, particularly the optic nerve and macula. And so our differential diagnosis was very broad initially. Um, she didn't have any known trauma, but 
a, you know, a number of autoimmune conditions or um, uh, blood dyscrasias were certainly in our thought process. And so we did a pretty thorough workup along with the rheumatology team and the pediatric team to kind of sort things out a little bit. This was her initial lab workup and I've sort of highlighted and read some of the important things. Of note, her protein and albumin were both very low. Her ALKFOS, uh, ALT, and SAT were elevated, indicating some uh, dysfunction of potentially the biliary and liver system. Her UA, she did have granular CAS and some trace protein. And then she had an extremely high elevated CK and LDH, indicated of muscle breakdown. And also an elevated triglyceride, likely in response to her low protein and her renal dysfunction. You can see all the other laboratory workups, which were unremarkable, including a significant workup for infectious uh, ideologies, all of which came back to be unremarkable. <clears throat> she had a further workup besides her lab workup that included uh, evaluation for her elevated muscle enzymes. This included a muscle biopsy, which demonstrated signs of diffuse myositis, an EMG, which concurred with those findings of myositis. She had an MRI of her many areas, but her MRI of her pelvis was consistent with myositis. She had an MRI of the brain and orbits, which also demonstrated myositis of the muscles of mastication and didn't show any evidence of optic nerve enhancement to suggest some sort of uh, optic nerve dysfunction in addition to the findings that we saw. Her chest x-ray was unremarkable. So her hospital course, she was diagnosed with presumed dermatomyositis and associated rhabdomyolysis. Myelolysis. Um, she had a very aggressive uh, anti-inflammatory treatment that was initiated, including a pulse of methylprednisone and then a transition to oral steroids, as well as initiation of uh, immune modulating therapy with methotrexate. She saw about every subspecialty group in the uh, primary care system, including rheumatology, renal, neurology, cardiology, ID, psychiatry, PMR, PT, OT, nutrition. Um, and she had gradual normalization of her muscle enzymes. Actually, over about a two to four week period, she was admitted either inpatient or in the, PM, in the physical medicine rehabilitation service. Approximately two weeks after her admission, she developed sort of the classic heliotrope rash, which is associated with juvenile dermatomyositis, which is of note because she's one of the few cases in the literature where she had ophthalmic findings or retinal findings prior to manifestations of these skin classic heliotrope rashes. Uh, post just discharge, just as evidence to the sort of morbidity of this disease as well as the treatment for the disease, she developed HSV stomatitis, she required a G-tube for feeding, she had MSA, SSA bacteremia, and also developed C. diff, so uh, obviously a very significant impact on her life. From an ophthalmologic standpoint, at her follow-up at one month, uh, her visual acuity had improved significantly. She was at 2070 and 2050. Otherwise, the rest of her exam anteriorly was unremarkable. And at her one-year follow-up, her vision had improved slightly more to 2050 and 2040. Again, the anterior exam was unremarkable. So looking at those time points, then at some of the other imaging, I think what's important, you have the right eye on top, the left eye on the bottom, and then the three color images, both presentation one month and one year. What's very noticeable is the dramatic improvement at one month. Um, there's still some residual cotton wool spots, some residual intraretinal hemorrhages that are notable, um, but they are significantly improved with the course of high IV steroids and oral prednisone that the patient was on initially. And then you have near complete resolution of her retinal findings um, at one year with the exception of maybe some uh, foveal, uh, some decreased foveal reflux at one year. And the same can be seen in the left eye as well. In terms of the fluorescein angiogram, this is a, just of her right eye, and there's some time points in terms of early, mid, and late that are missing at the different points. But I think, again, most noticeably, if you look at from presentation to one month, you see this dramatic improvement in this bilateral diffuse choroidopathy in the sort of pinpoint hyperfluorescent areas, which are basically completely resolved at one month. Um, and you also see a decrease in the retinal vascular staining. There was some peripherally still at one month, but uh, in general, this was dramatically improved. And then at one year, she has a completely normal fluorescein angiogram. The same can be said with the left eye. Again, very similar findings. You do still have some blockage from uh, retinal hemorrhages that were present and residual neurofibr nerve fiber layer infarcts, but otherwise, dramatic improvement in the retinal vascular leakage.
And the same can be seen with her OCT, with her neurosensory retinal detachment, subneurosensory, as well as her significant intraretinal uh, edema is nearly completely resolved. At one month, you can see she does have a very, uh, oops, sorry. At one month, she does have a very sm uh, small neurosensory uh, detachment in her left eye still. And also, very interestingly of note, worth pointing out and we'll discuss later, if you look at her inner nuclear layer at one month, you'll see this area of hyperreflective band, uh, both nasally and temporally. And as you go to a one year time point, you'll see that the area that was hyperreflective then has correlated areas of atrophy at the one year time point, um, consistent with a sort of newly described condition of uh, maculopathy in this pattern, likely involving the superficial retinal nerve capillary plexes. In terms of her initial outpatient medication regimen after she was discharged, you can see for a patient that was on no medications prior to admission and prior to diagnosis, she had a significant uh, medication load to treat uh, both the primary disease but as well as many of the side effects that then came from that. I'd like to spend a brief amount of time just highlighting juvenile dermatitis, dermatomyositis for those of you who may not be aware of it. It's a rare systemic vasculopathy. It usually occurs in young uh, children, usually between five and 10, a slight female to male predominance, uh, between two and five, depending on what study you look at. And the sort of classic findings are the systemic muscular weakness, uh, the heliotrope rash. You can sometimes have these gutron papules, which you can see in the picture in the uh, lower right. And then these associated constitutional symptoms, which were very notable in our patient. Uh, you can also have a GI vasculopathy of note. Um, which can cause a lot of issues with uh, nutrition and other things. In terms of treatment and prognosis, uh, really the best sort of uh, long-term study looking at this was by this group in Sanner, which had 60 patients that followed them for an average of approximately 16.8 years. Now the treatment for ju juvenile dermatomyositis has sort of trained, changed dramatically over this time course, but looking at that, um, data, you can see there's significant systemic morbidity associated with the disease and the treatment for the disease. Um, fortunately, the mortality, which was as high as 30% in the early 1960s, um, has now decreased approximately 2 to 3% uh, with the use of high-dose corticosteroids and immune-modulating therapy. Also of note, uh, looking sort of epidemiologically, approximately a third of these patients have a monocyclic disease, meaning they have one episode that then resolves and usually does not come back. But the majority of patients will have either a chronic continuous course, which is more consistent with what our patient has unfortunately experienced, or a polycyclic experience where they'll have multiple recurrences of disease. In terms of ocular manifestations of juvenile dermatomyositis, the largest sort of screening uh, study looking at this was a case review in Toronto of 82 patients who presented with ju juvenile dermatomyositis. And of those patients, uh, approximately 45 to 50 percent of them had lid manifestations, classic heliotrope rash. Uh, four, 17 percent of them eventually went on to develop corticosteroid-induced cataracts. One patient had an asymptomatic small retinal hemorrhage, much different than what was found in our patient, and none of the patients had any evidence of uveitis or inflammation inside the eye. In terms of a case review, in terms of review of the literature, interestingly, there are very few case reports of retinal involvement in juvenile dermatomyositis. Um, this is a list of all the cases that are in the literature. So the first one was initially described by Bruce in 1938. There was actually two cases. Uh, at that point, it wasn't called juvenile dermatomyositis, but it was a myositis that was in a young patient that sort of had all the classic symptoms of juvenile dermatomyositis and has later been uh, considered to be juvenile dermatomyositis looking back at it. And what you can see is that, you know, sorry for the very small print, but importantly, there's a fairly even distribution of females and males. And importantly, uh, at most, a lot of these patients had these notable retinal changes, which included cotton wool spots, intraretinal hemorrhages, uh, uh, macular edema, and retinal exudates. But a lot of these changes were not noted at presentation. The cases that had retinal changes at presentation were Bruce's, one of Bruce's patients, our patient, and then Harrison's patient in 1973. All the other cases had uh, diagnosed myositis or juvenile dermatomyositis and developed them at a later time point. And also of note, most patients actually have very good recovery of visual acuity. 
with the exception of a few patients described by Munro and Harrison who developed optic atrophy or macular scarring. Most patients actually returned uh, to 2020 or near 2020 vision. Our patient at 2040 or 2050 is even slightly on the worse end compared to most people, and that's probably related to her macular changes that were noted on her OCT. I thought I would just highlight a few of these cases historically, uh, mostly because I think they're fascinating in their description. This is the first case that was described by Bruce in 1938. And what's remarkable is, you know, this is not a photo that he took, but a drawing that he did. It has a remarkable resemblance to our patient and just unbelievable in terms of their artistic ability to demonstrate it. He actually described three cases. One of them was in an older patient that was 26 years old, but two in juvenile patients. Um, and again, a number of these other patients have similar findings to ours, not exactly the same, and a lot of them didn't have fluorescein angiograms, or if they did, they didn't have similar findings to our fluorescein angiogram, but had nice improvement in their vision with response to corticosteroids um, and resolution of this sort of perchers-like retinopathy or these changes in the nerve fiber layer. Again, another case described by Bader, and this one there was an OCT, did demonstrate improvement over time. And also interesting, this, this was the first one that had an FA, and they demonstrated that there was some pre-capillary occlusion on their fluorescein angiogram, which we didn't necessarily see on our fluorescein angiogram, um, but this patient retained very good vision post or er, afterwards. <coughs> um, in terms of a few other cases, this is uh, Bresco. This is one of the patients that, um, again, notable vision improvement going from 2060 and count fingers up to 2020 and 2030. And these two patients, a 19 year, or excuse me, a 13 year old and a nine year old patient. And again, you can see sort of similar macular findings. You don't see the retinal tortuosity that we saw in our patient though. Um, I also wanted to just highlight, this is a, actually a really interesting and new description that's been kind of recently come out, which is this description of paracentral acute middle maculopathy. Um, this was actually first described by Saraf in 2013, so it's a newly described finding based on OCT findings, and it's, this is actually the pictures of our patient, which is exactly what he has described, and that is, again, you have this hyperreflectivity of the inner nuclear layer, and he's actually described two types. There's a type one, which is hyperreflectivity of the inner nuclear layer, supposedly correlating with the uh, inner retinal nuclear cap or retinal capillary plexus, and a type two, which is a deeper in the sort of deeper retinal capillary plexus. But again, you see this hyperreflectivity that then leads to atrophy, which has classically been described. This is the first description of it in a patient with obviously juvenile dermatomyositis, as there's not been very many cases described. So in conclusion, uh, I think important things to know, juvenile dermatomyositis is a very rare systemic vasculopathy, so it's not a very common presentation. And presentation of it with ophthalmic retinal findings is even a more rare occurrence. Um, there are a few cases of this sort of Percher's-like retinopathy presenting in the setting of juvenile dermatomyositis. This is the first case of this sort of bilateral diffuse choroidopathy ever described in the literature in a patient with juvenile dermatomyositis. Uh, and interestingly, it's also one of the few cases uh, where the retinal findings preceded uh, classic heliotrope rash and other findings. Um, it is not, net, not yet known, interestingly, whether the severity of ocular disease may have any impact in terms of the prognostic va uh, any prognostic value in JDM and patients' risk for a sort of chronic course or a polycyclic course. Um, there's just not enough presentations of patients with ophthalmic findings to really uh, power a study to demonstrate this. Uh, and one of the questions that's raised from this is, you know, should all patients with diagnosed with juvenile dermatomyositis have an ophthalmic exam? And, you know, my thought personally is that that's probably unnecessary given that most patients um, who have juvenile dermatomyositis based on the Toronto study are not going to have ophthalmic findings. And if they are, they're going to be asymptomatic. And those patients who do have significant retinal findings were all symptomatic. And so I think, you know, those patients, you're not, by screening patients, you're not going to be identifying additional pathology or uh, patients and preventing morbidity. <clears throat> now, the question may be, if patients are symptomatic, they sure, certainly should be seen by ophthalmology, and it may be advisable then to escalate treatment based on severe ophthalmic findings or retinal findings. These are a list of my references, um, and then also my acknowledgments here. I'd like to particularly thank Dr. Vitale for his... Uh, very kind guidance in helping me put together this case. 
um, and uh, review all the photography pictures. Um, I'd like to thank Renee Choi, who's helping um, in addition with the write-up for this patient, and CJ Inman, who's one of the room, pediatric rheumatologists who's uh, participated in the care of this patient over many years, or over the last two years. I'd also like to thank our Moran Photography Department for their excellent work in terms of collecting just amazing pictures that really make a huge difference. So at this point, I'll take, uh, we'll have an open discussion for any questions. Uh, Dr. Vitali's here who can provide some guidance as well as Renee for any questions that patients might have. And if I'm able to uh, Skype or FaceTime with Dr. Petty right now, I may be there in person. So thank you so much.